Hey, what's going on? Juan here. And today we have a newly updated video guide on getting started with Home Assistant. We're going to go over the devices that we can use, the installation process, the initial configuration, and we also cover a few must have add ons and integrations that you should add after installing Home Assistant. Home Assistant can be installed on almost any device out there. For example, an old laptop, a Raspberry Pi, or an S server like Andre. There are also different installation methods. You can install the core version of Home Assistant on a Docker container or on Linux. The other method is to install the OS version on a Raspberry Pi or on a virtual machine. The core version does require more steps to configure, updating, and also installing different integrations. However, the Home Assistant OS version is an all-in-one solution. It comes with a supervisor, making it easier to update Home Assistant, create snapshots, and install different add-ons. When starting with Home Assistant, the OS version is definitely the way to go. And a Raspberry Pi is also a good device to start with. It is small, cheap, and it has low power consumption. So for this guide, I'm going to show you how to set up the OS version on a Raspberry Pi. However, if you're looking to set up Home Assistant on an Ubuntu server, a Proxmox machine, or an Andre NAS server, I have video tutorials for that as well. You can find links for them in the description below. Also, all steps that will follow in this tutorial, the devices, and the applications that we use will be available in a written guide on my website. You can find a link for that as well in the description. All right, to start, we'll need an SD card that is at least 32 gigabytes, and we're going to use Balina Etcher to install the Home Assistant image on the SD card. So connect the SD card to your computer and get the URL for the image via homeassistant.io slash installation slash Raspberry Pi. Scroll down to step four, select the 64-bit version for the Raspberry Pi that you have and copy the URL for the image. After that, open Balina Etcher, select flash from URL, enter the URL for the image and click on OK. Then click on select target, select the micro SD card and then click on select. Lastly, click on flash and give it a minute for the process to finish. Once the process completes, remove the SD card from your computer and connect it to the Raspberry Pi. Then connect the Raspberry Pi to your router with an Ethernet cable and boot it up. The Home Assistant OS will start downloading the latest version of Home Assistant. To access the web interface, open your browser and go to homeassistant.local colon 8123. Once the setup is completed, you can start with the initial configuration. On the first step, create a new administrator account to access the web interface. So enter a name, username, password, and click on create account. For step two, you can set up a custom name for your home assistant. Also set up the location, time zone, and the unit system. Click on next, and for step three, Home Assistant auto discovers the smart home devices connected to your home network. You can then add them and set them up into rooms. Click on finish, and the Home Assistant web interface comes up. If you still need to integrate more devices or online services, you can do so by going to configuration, integrations, and then click on add integrations. Some integrations are not yet available to set up directly from the web interface. So if you don't find the specific device or service here, you can check all the supported integrations by going to homeassistant.io forward slash integrations. One thing that I believe is good practice to do before configuring the Home Assistant dashboard is to go over your entities names. You want to create a naming convention that you can follow when naming your entities. This will make it easier to search for a specific entity and also differentiate between similar entities. An entity's name starts with the type of entity that it is, aka domain. For example, a switch, a light, a sensor, media player, etc. Then separated with a period, you will have the actual name for what the entity is for. A naming convention that a lot of us use is to add the room's name, either abbreviated or just the initials after the domain. For example, switch.lr air purifier plug, light.br floor lamp, etc. Sometimes you might also have two or more of the same device in a room, so you would also want to specify the position within that room. For example, if you have several lights, you could set it like light.lr floor lamp front and light that LR floor lamp back. You get the idea. So thinking about naming convention that works for you is definitely a good practice. You're definitely going to appreciate it later. 
To customize the dashboard, you can access the UI editor by clicking on the menu icon on the top right, and then Edit Dashboard. A pop-up comes up stating that Home Assistant automatically adds new entities to your dashboard. However, you want to customize it the way you want to, so check the option Start with an empty dashboard, and then click on Take Control. Now that you have access to the UI editor, click on the plus icon on the top left and add a new view. Views are like tabs in a browser and you can set up several views in the dashboard. Set up a title for the view. You can also set up an icon if you want and then click on save. Home Assistant has several different cards that you can choose for your entities and organize the web interface the way you want to. To add a new card, you can click on add card and select the type of card that you would like. A feature that I want to point out is that Home Assistant has both a light and a dark theme and it switches between the two automatically depending on your system preferences. However, if you want to set it up to a specific mode, you can go into your profile and under themes, you can change it from auto to either light or dark. In addition to that, you can also change the primary color and the accent color. All right, so you have Home Assistant installed and you configure the dashboard the way you want it to. What's next? There are a few must-have add-ons that you want to install in Home Assistant. The first one, which is going to allow access to Home Assistant remotely, is the NGINX Proxy Manager. This add-on will also need the Maria database, so we need to install that add-on as well. On top of that, you need to set up a couple of things on your router settings. You need to assign a static IP address to your Home Assistant, and then set up two port forwarding rules, to forward port 80 and port 443 to Home Assistant. To assign an IP address to Home Assistant, you can also do it from the Home Assistant web interface, but I personally recommend having the setting configured on the router directly. If you want to set it up via Home Assistant, go into Supervisor, System, and under Host, click on Change next to the IP address. Next, on the pop-up that comes up, click on the IPv4 and change it from DHCP to Static IP. Then reboot the host so the changes take effect. When you assign a new IP address to Home Assistant, you will need to reopen your instance using the new IP address. After you have the static IP address configured, locate the port forwarding settings in your router. Add a new rule and set the port to 80, the forwarding IP to the Home Assistant IP address, the forwarding port to 80, and the protocol set it to TCP. Save the new rule and create another one using the same information but with port 443 instead. After you have this set up, you might need to reboot your router for the changes to take effect. With this configure, you can go ahead and set up the two add-ons needed for remote access. So open Home Assistant, go into Supervisor, Add-on Store, search for the MariaDB add-on, open it and click on Install. Then go into Configuration and set up a username and password. On the right, enter the same username and for the database, leave it set to Home Assistant. Save the changes, go back to the Info tab, and start the add-on. After that, go back to the add-on store, search for NGINX Proxy Manager, open it, and install it. After it is installed, start the add-on, and click on Open Web UI. To sign in for the first time, enter in the email field admin at example.com, and for the password, enter change me. Then sign in and a pop-up comes up for you to change the default credentials to something private. To set up the remote access, you first need to create a DuckDNS subdomain. On another tab, go to DuckDNS.org and log in using one of the available methods. Create a subdomain and your new URL will be the subdomain that you created, that DuckDNS.org. Go back to the NGINX Proxy Manager, click on Hosts, Proxy Hosts, and then click on Add a Proxy Host. On the domain name, enter your .dns URL. Then enter your Home Assistant IP address under forwarding hostname slash IP. For the forwarding port, enter 8123. Enable the option WebSocket Support, and then go to the SSL tab. Under SSL Certificate, select Request a new SSL Certificate. Then enable Force SSL, Enter your email on the email address for Let's Encrypt and agree to the terms of service. Click on Save and you should now be able to access your Home Assistant locally using the IP address or the hostname and remotely using the DuckDNS URL. The last thing that you need to do is to set up the internal and the external URL in the Home Assistant configurations. So go back to Home Assistant, click on Configuration and then General. 
under external URL, enter your .dns URL, including https colon forward slash forward slash at the beginning. For the internal URL, type http colon forward slash forward slash the home assistant IP address and then port 8123 at the end. The next add-on that you want to add to Home Assistant is VS Code. With this add-on, you can manage your Home Assistant configuration files directly on a browser and from any device. The add-on does use a lot more resources, so it's recommended to install it on a Raspberry Pi with at least 4GB of RAM. Alright, to install it, go back to Supervisor, Add-on Store, search for Visual Studio Code, click on it, and then install it. To easily access the add-on, you can toggle the option Show and Sidebar. Start the add-on, then click on Open Web UI, and you now have access to the Home Assistant configuration files. If you rather not use this add-on and instead use the VS Code on your computer directly, then you can do that as well and access the Home Assistant configuration files on your computer. To do that, you need to install Samba Share, which is another must-have add-on in Home Assistant. In the add-on store, search for Samba Share. Click on it and install it. When the installation completes, go to Configuration and set up a username and password. Click on Save, go back to the Info tab and start the add-on. To access the Home Assistant files on your computer, open your File Explorer and on the search bar on the top, enter backslash backslash Home Assistant backslash config. Or you can also enter the Home Assistant IP address instead of the hostname. Another add-on that I recommend installing is the WireGuard add-on. WireGuard is a modern open source VPN protocol that you can use to connect from any public hotspot and have a secure connection to your home network. Also, if you use Google Assistant either on your phone or on a smart speaker, you can link Home Assistant to control your entities using your voice. I do have separate tutorial videos on how to set up both the WireGuard add-on and the Google Assistant integration. You can find links for them in the description below. Alright, the last thing that you want to do after you have Home Assistant all set up is to create a snapshot of your setup. So if something ever happens and you need to reinstall Home Assistant, you can easily recover your whole setup with that snapshot. To create a snapshot, go into Supervisor and then Snapshots. When creating a new one, you can set up a name for it, select if you want to create a full or a partial snapshot of your system, and you can also set up a password so when you try to restore from a snapshot, you will be required to enter the password to unlock it. After you have the snapshot created, you can click on it and download it so you can save it in your computer. There are many more integrations that you can add to make the experience with Home Assistant better, but we can cover them all in one video. However, I do have more Home Assistant tutorial videos coming, so definitely stay tuned for that. I hope that this tutorial has helped you get started with Home Assistant. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and I'll see you in the next video.